Okay, so what we're going to do is take a look at uh, aves, which uh, are the birds. And so we look back at the last cladogram saying that birds are based on the cladistic model either with reptiles uh, or crocodiles aren't with reptiles and they're, they're pulled out. Um, so that's, but traditionally we have birds as their own class. And so we're just going to address them here quickly and go over some of the key unique features uh, that they have. Um, that we don't see in really any of the other uh, reptiles. So not seen in the crocodilians, nor uh, any of the other lizards, snakes, um, turtles, anything like that. So what do they have that's different? Uh, and then we're gonna look at some of the skeletal features. Um, so things that they have in common uh, as well. So common features as far as skeletal structure. So uh, I was thinking about drawing and I'll, I'll add a little bit to this, um, looking at say, uh, velociraptor type dinosaur uh, how its skeleton might compare to this where you might see certain differences because ultimately they would actually see a, a lot of similarities they would actually be uh, very similar in many ways um, and, and the same actually we're going to find a lot of the same bones that, that we have in our in our bodies as well so upper arm bone humerus we looked a little bit uh, at that uh, when we started to look at some of the uh, tetrapod evolution uh, and then we have uh, forearm bones. Okay, so here we have the ulna. And then the radius. And then here, so you can say, well, what are these bones? Uh, these are actually um, sort of going to be more of like wrist bones. Okay, so carpals. Uh, and then phalanges would be here, like finger bones here. So they have really an extended uh, group of bones. We've seen this in, so, in some of the animals that uh, are the wrist bones that are sort of really extended and have some new uh, variety to them to add some additional structure. So you can see the wing, you know, is a lot of the same bones as in our arms, except uh, reduced uh, reduction of the fingers, the phalanges, uh, but an extension of the carpals. The legs, all right, we also have a femur. And then they have a, a tibia and fibula. And, and we have these two. Now, um, what they're going to then have is down here, which kind of cut off here, is there's another bone that kind of sticks again down from there. So what is that bone that's kind of heading down to the, so these are the actually toes. So these are more phalanges. This bone here, the one sticking down right, right to the foot, is called a tarso. Metatarsus, um, in our class, you're not going to have to worry about that in particular. Just kind of letting you know that there, there are some additional bones. And you can see the same thing in the foot as in the arm bones. Uh, extensions of essentially what would be our kind of wrist type bones. They have extensions of them. Now, uh, they have obviously a cranium. And vertebrae. But now let's look at some other structures. So we have then uh, our pelvis, right, our hip bone here. And one of the last uh, lectures, we kind of looked at some of the uh, bones of the pelvis. So here's sort of the, their pubis there. So what we have here, though, is something uh, that's going to be unique, and it's going to be one of the differences that we'll see ver when the birds versus all the other reptiles. Uh, the reptiles have typically long tails, or they have uh, vertebrae that extend through the tail. When you see a bird, birds have tails, but their tails don't have their vertebrae extending through them. Right? The, the, the bird's um, tail vertebrae get fused um, oops I ran out of room set so we have fused vertebrae at the tip there just like we have uh, fused verte vertebrae in a coccyx um, at the end of our vertebrae instead of having a tail
I just style uh, will lead to the sort of fused vertebrae there. So they have a very short little tail, actually, when you look at the vertebrae themselves, um, because then the, the end bones are all fused together. Here we have the ribs. And what you'll find is that some of the ribs will then connect to, just like our ribs connect to our sternum, But birds, whoops, two E's here, are going to have this structure, which is very important and unique to them. So I'm going to like extra try to highlight it here. Oh, my pink went so pink. Yeah. It's called a keel. So essentially, our pectoral muscles connect to the sternum. Birds, because they are adapted for flight, have to have incredibly strong pectoral muscles, right, for sort of a, this down stroke, right, in flight. And it really will allow them to lift off, especially from on the ground, to try to get um, to get that power and, and move the air, compress it. So their pectorals have to be so large, they really need a larger attachment point. So there is a protrusion that sort of sticks off. That, so if this is, your sternum is flat, you know, a bird's sternum you know, would stick out really far like this, so the muscle can actually attach way out um, onto this structure, and that structure is called the keel, and that's what we have here. You can sort of see it, but if you saw the actual skeleton, you would see uh, that. And it looks, and I think it's called that because of the uh, the keel of a boat. It kind of has that same sort of look to it as well. Now we have also uh, bones called clavicles. Okay, so the clavicle, our collarbone, okay, extends from the sternum here. All right, up into the scapula up there. And so this is going to be their sort of clavicle here. But in birds, what we have is something unique, is that the clavicle then doesn't connect directly to the sternum. Uh, the two ends of it fuse together. Uh, and so they're going to um, create a structure called a a furcula. So the furcula is essentially a fused clavicle. And it's what we will also call the wishbone. So if you're familiar with that from, uh, say, a turkey having the wishbone, uh, that is the fused clavicle. That's what that particular bone is. And that's unique also, again, for flight because it provides a bit of a spring, right, to kind of as they compress downward. To kind of get that spring back. They don't really have very strong back muscles, um, but what they do is they'll have additional muscles. I'm not going to go into all the details in this particular class because it's organismal. We're trying to cover you know all the animals um, in a more of a zoology course or just an ornithology course, which is where we would actually study birds themselves. So you can take a whole entire course uh, on just birds. Uh, you find that they have muscle, again, that's attached from the chest, but that loops kind of around the back of the humerus. And, they can, and as it contracts, it actually can pull their um, humerus backward or upward. So they have certain muscles that pull it forward, and they have certain muscles that pull it backward. And all those muscles are essentially attached to, to the uh, keel, but then they are attached to different places on the humerus in terms of how they're going to pull it forward or backward. But getting that, that up stroke then um, gets a little bit of extra spring from the uh, fused clavicle or the furcula. Um, trying to see what else I could point out here with the skeleton. Uh, and actually, then one of the, we'll end on sort of one of the most uh, important actual features here all right, is the beak. Usually it's called a keratinized beak because it's made of a uh, protein called keratin. Uh, this is the same kind of material that makes, say, our fingernails as well. So instead of having uh, teeth inserted in sockets all right, in a jaw, they've lost that feature but then gained this new feature. What we're also going to find is as we look at these bones, all right, while the structure of the bones are the same, if you look to the interior of the bone, 
you're going to find that they're hollow. Now, not just completely empty hollow, there is, so if we look at a sort of cross section of the bone, um, this is not the exact sort of pattern or anything like that, but there's going to be sort of a, a matrix of bone material that supports it, just kind of like a corrugated cardboard. You know, it can be very strong, but actually has a lot of air space in it. It's not completely solid, and their bone is similar, more similar to that. Uh, the idea here is with birds, mostly all their adaptations, all these unique differences are for flight, and as a result, they are to lose weight. By losing weight, I mean a bony jaw with teeth is heavy. A keratinized beak is very light. Solid bone is very heavy, but the pneumatized bone is strong, very strong, but light. Okay, And so most of the adaptations that birds are going to have that make them very different from these other reptiles are all going to be to lighten up their bodies so that they can fly. Now, you also think that, oh, there's some birds that don't fly, and there are, um, but they sort of evolved after the birds uh, that could fly. So it's kind of like flight evolves, and then some birds adapt to other environments and other lifestyles, and so then they don't necessarily fly, like a penguin. Uh, but their ancestors were flying uh, birds or had all those adaptations to fly. Um, another adaptation that they'll have for flight, uric acid. So when animals, so all animals sort of produce nitrogenous waste, we talked about this a little bit with back with some of the other animals with uh, the worms and a little bit with the arthropods and how they started to develop nephridia and proto-nephridia and metanephridia. So these structures like the flame cells originally in the flatworms in order to filter out waste material. Now, typically this urea uh, is water soluble, but it's not that water soluble um, and uh, it requires in a lot of water all right, to solubilize it so in producing urine and so that has a lot of weight and the weight is all just holding waste material so instead of producing urea birds produce uric acid so it's a similar molecule but different as a much higher uh, solubility um, and they could so it could be incredibly concentrated right so when a birds excrete their waste there's very little liquid that goes along with it Right, because they don't have to store it. So that way they don't have to store a lot of liquid in their body just for waste material. They need liquid for other things, but not for that. So that's another way that they can uh, help themselves become light. Now these air sacs, accessory air sacs, are not for um, lightening them up necessarily. It might sound like it is. It's really more for oxygen flow. So um, without drawing sort of a whole respiratory system, when, when we have our lungs... Sort of branching off. You know, air will come in to the lungs and then it circulates around. Right? So what we'll get is then diffusion of then carbon dioxide from our blood vessels uh, into those cavities and then there'll be oxygen sort of diffusing that we oxygen that we breathe in uh, diffusing outward into our circulatory system and, and kind of then we exhale and then the carbon dioxide goes back out now also some oxygen will go back out and some carbon dioxide comes in so it's not a completely uh, efficient system and there's a little bit of a pause there and goes back and forth for us it's just fine but for a bird in flight there's an incredibly high oxygen demand so what birds have uh, is, is a whole separate, very complicated um, circulatory system or, and respiratory system, uh, the way in which they're integrated. So that what we have is sort of a constant flow. So the lungs aren't structured like this. They're slightly different. Um, and uh, they have these accessory air sacs to store air, which essentially means that when the bird breathes in oxygen, air goes into these, these accessory sacs something else to draw that uh, sort of color wise so these accessory sacs so i'll just do two of them here but there are actually s several more of them uh, and some air goes into them now when the bird exhales 
and pushes air out. The air from the accessory sacs then comes into the lungs to have that oxygen then, then circulated. So essentially, they're always getting new oxygen flowing into their lungs. Whether they're inhaling or exhaling, there's a constant flow of oxygen kind of coming into there. So they can really maximize their ATP production for their muscle contraction. So uh, they can continue to fly and not just go yeep and, and fall out of the sky because they um, they seized up and they had a cramp. You know, So that doesn't happen because they always have enough oxygen uh, for aerobic respiration. And, and these accessory air sacs are partly what, what helps them do that, along with a number of other much more complicated features, uh, again, which we, we can't really go uh, completely into. A few other things about them. So related to that, so we're talking a little bit about the birds and their metabolism. They do have a very high metabolic rate, and so they are endothermic, right? which means they're, they're warm-blooded. producing heat all right, through their metabolism. Uh, and we have some, most reptiles are considered to be uh, cold-blooded or ectothermic, but we know that many of the dinosaurs, well, we don't know 100% for sure uh, with which particular ones, but for many of them, there's a lot of evidence that shows that they were also endothermic. All right? They were also warm-blooded or some version of that. There's not, um, there's a whole bunch of grades of, of, of the regulation of temperature and how set it is for a certain set points, or is there a fluctuation in that? But their metabolism likely uh, made them some version of being endothermic as well. And one of the last things to talk about here, because um, again, we have lots of other things to, to cover uh, still in the course, feathers. So we're not gonna go into uh, detail on the feathers, but birds have this unique adaptation, right? So instead of scales covering their body, like the reptiles, that's kind of what sets the reptiles apart, or fur and hair covering the bodies like the mammals. So uh, hair is unique to mammals. It's going to be one of their characteristic traits. The scales, different certain types of scales are unique for reptiles, which are different than fish scales. Fish have specific types of scales that are unique and sometimes classify the fish. Reptile scales are different um, and unique to them. And so are the feathers. So the feathers are unique to the birds and birds have a variety of different types of feathers. There are flight feathers and different types of flight feathers, primaries and secondaries. Um, there are downy feathers that are close to the, the body um, that trap in he uh, heat, but in addition to that can help regulate heat. So they can keep them warm when it's cold outside. It can keep them cool uh, when it's warm. So vice versa, because they kind of have this insulation against the outside temperature, allows them to regulate that temperature much better. Uh, typically, the feathers uh, through preening have oil um, put on them, so they're fairly waterproof. Um, there are a few birds that aren't completely waterproof, say like a cormorant, um, because they dive uh, in the water. And if you ever see a cormorant sitting uh, on the side of, a, of the ocean, they, just, they sit there with their, their wings open like this because they're drying off. But most birds don't have to do that uh, because they have uh, oil coating on their feathers. Um, the feathers have uh, direct connections then actually to to the bones themselves um, and, and that's something again that's a little bit more than what we can go into right now um, because you can't really see it on this drawing but there's there's some uh, interaction there in the way they develop so um, birds what do they have specifically as unique features kind of setting them apart from these other groups of animals say from mammals and the other reptiles keratinized beak they're going to have the pneumatized bone Right, so hollow bones. Uh, they're going to have the fused clavicles uh, into the furcula. They're going to have an extension of the sternum as a keel. Uh, they're going to have some unique bones or uh, modifications in sort of the wrist and um, ankle bones that are modified to their feet uh, and the wings. Uh, they're going to have a fused tail. So that's going to be a different here. The, the reptiles have a long tail with vertebrae in it, uh, and they have the fused vertebra in the tail. Um, and then they have the uh, pubis uh, oriented in a different way um, so that that's what the, the bird orientation I went over in the last lecture versus the, the lizard orientation for it. And, and we talked about some of these other things as well. So just kind of keep in mind maybe several, say for, for our exam purposes, maybe about five different things that birds have that are unique adaptations that both uh, minimize their weight uh, and that are unique adaptations, say for flight. Keep those in mind.